What's up, everybody? Welcome back. We are here with some more MMA DFS picks and lineup advice, DraftKings and FanDuel, this time for UFC Abu Dhabi. They're making their yearly trip out there. And uh, it's Umar Nurmagomedov, Corey Sandhagen. We're here to break it down for you. Welcome. I'm Brian Jester, co-founder here at Occupy Fantasy, joined by Jake the Snake, owner of MMADFS.com. Jake, what's up, man? How you doing? Good, man. Good to have you back. Hope you enjoyed the week off. Yeah, on vacation, now I'm back, and uh, honestly, you know, getting tired of, of some of these weekends off. Uh, the football grind has started. UFC, lots of great cards, including this one, and I'm happy to absolutely do nothing but watch this on Saturday. Uh, if you're new here, welcome. If you're a returning viewer, welcome back. What we're going to do in this video, break down the main event between Nurmagomedov and Sanhagen, talk about the one UFC newcomer on their card, give some background to their fighting style. Got a handful of fighters that have less than four fights in the UFC. We'll give some context to their stats with our favorite game, good fighter, bad fighter, good matchup, bad matchup. And then we'll close out the show with a fight that you have to target in DFS, as well as our stream parlay of the week. Stick around to the end. You won't want to miss it. Uh, and I say that seriously and somewhat jokingly when you see what our picks are for the stream parlay. So, Jake, let's talk about this main event, Umar Nurmagomedov. Seemingly, everyone has been ducking fights against him. Undefeated fighter, extremely talented. Sandhagen, doesn't matter. He'll fight him. And uh, it sounds like both guys are promised a title shot if they win. Interesting matchup. Sandhagen seems like a popular underdog pick, just based on what I've been reading around the internet and on social media. How do you see this fight playing out? And then more importantly, what does this fight mean for our low-risk and high-risk lineups on DraftKings and FanDuel? Yeah, man, super anticipated fight because it was booked a year ago it was supposed to be on the nashville card umar pulled out of that one you know a couple of weeks in advance and rob font stepped in and then san hagen dominated him on the mat i was actually at that card was really looking forward to seeing this fight live but here we are a year later so uh better late than never so you know umar 28 years old 5-0 and in the ufc 17-0 and as a pro cousin of habib elite wrestling really good striking uh he actually Averages 0 0.56 significant strikes absorbed per minute. Fewest in UFC history for anyone with five or more fights. So that's always a fun set. Uh, has never been past the third round before. So championship round cardio, still a mystery. Uh, he looked pretty tired after his last fight, after a three-round decision. Definitely seemed pretty winded in his uh, victory speech there. So, I mean, I don't know. He wasn't training for a five-round fight, but something to consider. He also got dropped in the opening minute of that fight against the UFC newcomer. He did bounce back. He dominated the fight on the mat, which is what he normally does. But, you know, somewhat concerning about his durability. Um, but also, you know, he, he at least he faced some adversity. You can say that. And he did bounce back. And then, he you know, he still killed it. Like, he has all the tools required to be champion. You know, wrestling, striking, crazy kicking game, super good question mark kicks. And in terms of DFS, you know, Crazy DFS scores, like in his five wins, 118, 114, 105, 105, 112 draft, DraftKings points. And those are in three-round fights. So with five rounds to work with, just insane scoring potential in DFS. Um, obviously a massive step up in competition. He's going from fighting a debuting fighter to a title contender in San Hagen. So you can't have a bigger swing in terms of the level of competition you've been facing. And yeah, no one has wanted to fight Umar, so he has had a pretty easy strength of schedule for the most part. But, I mean, that's no fault of his own. I mean, the guy's trying to fight people, and basically Corey Sandhagen's the only highly ranked guy who's been willing to take the fight. He's done it twice now. Um, I think it's going to be a good fight, man. I hope we get to see a fun striking battle. Uh, it is interesting that both guys are so well-rounded because you have Sandhagen, 33 years old, 10-3 and three in the UFC. He came in as a super flashy striker, but he's been looking to wrestle a ton lately in his recent matches. So I think um, I think it'll be interesting to see if we get more of a wrestling match or if we get more of a striking battle because we saw San Hagen dominate Font on the mat. We saw him uh, out-wrestle Vera for a, in a five-round decision just before that. But that was after he beat Song Yudong in a striking battle. That was when uh, Song got that nasty cut and it looked like they were going to stop the fight for about 20 minutes and then they finally stopped it after the fourth round in a doctor stoppage. So, you know, San Hagen does have some big wins and he's fought the tougher competition in his career. He's the more seasoned, more experienced. Uh, I think that definitely counts for something, but we, he, we haven't seen him really tested against someone like Umar that's as well-rounded and as 
good a wrestler. So I'm curious to see how Sam Higgins' defensive wrestling holds up because his offensive wrestling has looked good lately. But, you know, these are strikers for the most part. I mean, Barra has grappling, but we've seen him get taken down. And, you know, Rob Font's primarily a striker who's also struggled with being taken down. So I think it's a pretty interesting matchup. I think in terms of Sandhagen, I mean, like you say, he's going to be popular because he's averaged 109 DraftKings points in his 10 UFC wins. And the only time he failed to score at least 91 was in a three-round decision against Rafael Asuncio, and no one scores well against him. So, like, when he wins, he scores well. And now he's super cheap at 7000 on DraftKings and $14 on FanDuel. So... Hard to see him getting left out of the optimal lineup if he does win. And, you know, with Umar, it's just massive scoring potential. So even at his expensive price tag, it seems like barring a poorly timed finish, he's also going to end up in the winning lineup most likely if he wins. So I think overall it's a high upside fight, high floor fight. Uh, it's slightly favored to go the distance. So I think that that's probably good for Umar, you know, because – the one way he wins and busts is probably in a poorly timed finish. It's going to be harder for him to bust over five rounds just based on his style, you know, based on volume, smothering wrestling. Like, I think we have massive scoring potential. Uh, I'm on the Umar side here. I think he wins the decision, but it wouldn't be shocking if Sandhagen, you know, pulled it off somehow. I think it would probably take a knockout. I don't really think Sandhagen's going to win the decision here. I don't think he's going to out-wrestle Umar. I think that it's going to be hard for him to put up a crazy volume number just based on how hard Umar has been to hit. I mean, you look at the the record, the fewest, you know, strikes absorbed like ever on average, uh, that definitely makes it challenging for Sandhagen. And then where the fight is taking place in the world. I mean, the crowd is going to be behind Umar just one more benefit for him if it does go the distance. So I kind of view Sandhagen as needing a KO to win. Um, I think he's got, you know, maybe somewhat of a decent floor in a loss. Uh, you know, he's been in fight stacks before. If we get a slate where only one or two underdogs win, it's not crazy to think a fight stack could be in the winner, but always an unlikely scenario, especially when we have 13 fights, lots of underdogs to choose from. Um, so, yeah, I'm on Umar. Uh, you know, in, in low risk on DraftKings, you stack it. In high risk, you probably want to play one in the vast majority of your lineups. And, uh, yeah, I think the winner is going to be in the optimal lineup on both sides most likely. Yeah, I think that's fair. Not going out on a limb by any means. Uh, and I think in, in any small field GPPs, I mean, just think a 1,000 players or less. You want at least one of these guys and probably all of your lineups. Where it gets interesting is in the large field GPP on both sites. And, uh, you know, just because we both believe that this has a very high probability of being in the optimal lineup. If you've been watching our shows before, you know very well that things happen. Eye pokes, low, low blows, ill-timed finishes random weird striking battles where no one does anything for a round or two things happen so uh, it is worth leaving some out in some of your uh, large field lineups your 20 max and your 150 max but for anything smaller you definitely want one of these guys in your line lineups on DraftKings and FanDuel now Jake let's move on and let's talk about the one newcomer on the card and that is in the 10th fight of the night second from the beginning it's Jordan Vucinic uh, in a really tough matchup here in his debut Lots of tape on this guy, readily available on UFC Fight Pass. What have you seen from Vucinic? Uh, what is his strength of schedule, his fighting style, and his chances here against Guram Kutatilatse? Yeah, man. I mean, spots don't get much tougher for making your UFC debut. He's coming in 28 years old, 13-2 and two with eight finishes. Pretty well-rounded. Seems to have, you know, pretty quick striking, okay grappling. Not the best defenses. Seen him drop multiple times. But he's making a short notice debut up a weight class against an absolute monster. And Jordan just fought, fought two weeks ago. Uh, that fight did end in like 82 seconds, an 82 second guillotine over like a journeyman, not an impressive opponent. But still, uh, you know, it's back to back fights is always a little bit tricky. It was that fight was at a catch weight at 159, and this fight's at 155. And he normally fights at 145. So at least he. He didn't have like two hard weight cuts back to back, but still, I mean, preparing for back to back fights is always tough. Uh, so this guy was the former Cage Warriors featherweight champion, but if you go go back to how he won the belt, it was in a super questionable split decision against Morgan Charrier, who is like notorious for blowing split decisions. I have no idea how he won the fight, honestly. I thought Charrier won pretty easily. Uh, not the case, apparently. And then he defended it with a submission win in his next fight. And then Jordan got absolutely dominated in a five-round decision against Paul Hughes, 
one judge scored the fight 50 to 43 just to give you an idea of like <laughs> how rough it was like got knocked down at multiple points just a bloody mess uh yeah i mean paul hughes completely dominated uh, especially like the second half of that fight and then after that jordan bounced back with four straight submission wins but all against the lower level of competition he fought two guys that only weighed in at like 143 pounds i mean definitely some dubious competition along the way recently so take all of his finishes with a grain of salt and i mean it, this is clearly the toughest matchup of, of his career against Jerome kudaladze who's an absolute monster so i think jordan's going to be a guy that we're more interested in then maybe in his second fight. Uh, I don't have a ton of interest in playing him here. I think he would need Kudaladze to completely gas out the way he did against Brenner to uh, to have a real shot here. Yeah, I will say, extremely sick tattoos on Vucinich's part. And <laughs> Paul Hughes, complete domination in that match. And again, I don't watch much MMA outside of the UFC, but I do know Paul Hughes' name solely because anytime any fighter drops out, the Twitter comments are immediately sign Paul Hughes, sign Paul Hughes, sign Paul Hughes. So I assume he has some level of talent, and uh, his record indicates uh, he does. So not going to put that too much on uh, on uh, Vucinich, but uh, uh, on Vucinich. But again, extremely tough spot here in his debut, upper weight class. I mean, Jake, just a typical spot here where upper weight class, short notice, we typically fade, look to target those guys in the second fight. Let's see what that second matchup ends up looking like. Now let's move on to. Good fighter, bad fighter, good matchup, bad matchup. This is where we look at fighters who have less than four fights in the UFC, give some context to their stats. It's a really brief segment where I just say the name of the fighter. Jake tells me, are they good or bad? And is this matchup good or bad for DFS? If you've been around, you know this game. If you're new, I think you'll enjoy it because it gives some context to more fighters. Then uh, uh, We can't talk about every fighter, but it does give some context to some of these newer fighters or fighters you may not be familiar with. And on that note, uh, if you're not subscribed already, make sure you are subscribed to the channel. I know there are quite a few of you who unsubscribed because we were doing best ball shows every single day here, and that's not your thing. I understand. We moved the best ball content to a second channel. You won't see those notifications anymore. So if you unsubscribed and you're interested in our UFC content, now's the time to resubscribe to this channel. We'd appreciate it. Uh, and I'll let you know when we post these videos on Friday and Saturday for UFC. Now, good fighter, bad fighter, Jake. We will start with an interesting fight because of the line movement. Rolando Bedoya has two fights in the UFC, two losses, but now is nearly a coin flip in this matchup against Jai Herbert. Is he good or bad? And is this a good or bad matchup? Yeah, crazy line move from plus 150 to plus 105 over the week. Um, yeah, he's dropping down from 170. 155 i think he's he's like a good offensively minded fighter bad defense you can tell that by his striking numbers he both lands and absorbs the highest number of strikes on the slate on average um i don't think we can call him good quite yet but he's good for dfs and i think it's a good matchup against the fragile jai herbert who has also struggled with his defensive wrestling uh fair enough victoria dudakova two wins in the ufc she is undefeated uh i'm I'll I'll say it. I don't know if it's uh, entirely warrants it to call her an undefeated fighter, but here she is, and now she's up against Sam Hughes. Is she good or bad? As at least as good as her record indicates, and is a good or bad matchup against Sam Hughes? Yeah, she's a bad fighter, <laughs> and I think it's a bad matchup, man. Hughes has made a lot of improvements in her career. There we go. Glad we're on the same page there. Uh, we talked about Kutalatse a bit. Uh, when talking about his opponent Vucinich, uh, but is he actually good or bad? And I think. His record and probably his DraftKings fight logs may throw some people off to how good this guy really is. And then I assume you think this is a good matchup solely based on the situational factors of Vucinich's short notice up a weight class. Yeah, definitely, man. Guram is probably the best one and two fighter yeah. on the roster. Um, you know, this guy spars with like Shamayev, who's significantly bigger. And it made it sound like those, those sparring sessions were fairly even. Uh, he's a good fighter and a good matchup. Fair enough. All right, moving on. Next, we have Shamil Gatsiev, who you earlier in the week told me had the biggest change in opponents in such a short time frame. They, uh, he wins his debut. They gas him up and put him in a main event slot against Jairzinho Rosenstrike. Uh, unsurprisingly, gas is out there, as you called that week. Uh, and now he faces Dante Mays. So where, where is the equilibrium here, Jake? Is he good or bad? And is this a good or bad matchup? <laughs> Man, he's still bad. This guy is like four minutes of cardio, but he's massive. He can wrestle a little bit. He's got decent power, and um, he's going to have the crowd behind him. He's a bad fighter in a good matchup. All right, that's all we can ask for sometimes. It truly is. All right, this next matchup is between two fighters who have just one fight in the UFC each. 
in both of them lost their debuts. It's Muhammad Yaya and Kawa Fernandez. Give me the rundown of these guys. Are they good or bad? Is their first matchup in the UFC indicative of their potential? And how do you see this fight playing out between these two guys? So I think Fernandez is better than he looked in his debut. His biggest issues are defensive wrestling and cardio, and he went against the wrestler who never gets tired in his debut. So worst <laughs> possible matchup in his last fight. Um, he's a good finisher. I mean, again, I just pointed out his two deficiencies that may prevent him from being called a good fighter. But he's a good finisher, high upside, and it's a good matchup. Yaya is terrible. Um, yeah, Yaya is a bad fighter for sure. The only thing that you could argue that would make it a better spot for Yaya is Fernandez has slowed down in the back half of the fights. And if he does completely guess out, I mean, who knows? Yaya is the hometown guy. Maybe he comes back, wins the decision, or even like finds a late finish. But Yaya is not any good, man. He's terrible. All right, well, there it is. Next, we have Azmat Mirzakhanov, who is 3-0 in the UFC, 13-0 in general, uh, and he has two finishes in the UFC. Is he good or bad? And how does this matchup look in uh, another decently tough matchup after getting Dustin Jacoby here in Alonzo Minifield? Yeah, man, I think he's good. Like, I wish we actually knew how old he was. Because I know he's listed at 35. This guy's been looking like he was 35 for the last 20 years. Um <laughs> It's a tricky matchup with Menafield because Menafield can wrestle a little. I know Menafield just got like murdered in like 12 seconds in his last fight, but he also lost his mind coming into that matchup. Um, it's not the easiest matchup or the toughest matchup. Like I'm, I've been going back and forth on this because it's like if if Mirzakhanov doesn't get the early knockout, he's not going to score well. He's not going to return value. So he's very dependent on an early knockout. So high upside, but he's not getting there in a decision or even a late knockout. And, you know, Menafield's been knocked out twice in his career. So it's not the worst. It's kind of average. I don't know. It's a tricky one. All right. Fair enough. And finally, we have the co-main event, Shara Bullet Magomedov here. Uh, some opponent changes here, but he does get Mihao Olesejuk here. Should be an extremely fun fight to watch. That doesn't always necessarily translate into DFS. Do you think that's different for this matchup? Is Shara as good as his 13-0 record indicates? And how do you see this fight playing out? Yeah, this is another one where he's probably dependent on landing an early knockout. Since he doesn't grapple at all, he would need an absolutely insane striking total to still get there at his high price tag. So probably dependent on an early knockout. And, you know, both these guys are going to come to bang, man. I, I think that this is going to be a wild striking battle. I think someone's probably getting knocked out. But the way the fight busts is if Shara wins the decision, then in that case, he probably won't get there. Any other instance is going to be a knockout or, like, Maybe Ola Jacek could win the decision, like slight chance, but probably not. I don't know. I mean, the crowd's going to be behind Shara for sure. Uh, that is true. That is true. All right, let's finish out the show here with a fight that you have to target in DFS and our stream parlay of the week. Before we do, make sure you check out Jake's work at MMADFS.com. We know many of you just watch the free content, and we appreciate you, uh, and that's why we do these shows. If you want that extra edge, you don't mind paying for some content, you don't mind supporting in more ways than one, check out Jake's site, MMADFS.com, where he has premium content, write-ups, projections, everything you need for DFS and betting, and OccupyFantasy.com is where we have our model, our plug write-up, and uh, our lineup builder that allows you to build up to 300 lineups for DraftKings and FanDuel using our optimal lineup criteria. Uh, Jake, fight that you have to target in DFS. Whoever wins is likely to sco score extremely well. Which one are you picking? I mean, I do like the one we just talked about, the co-main with Shara and Ola Jacek. I think someone's probably getting knocked out. I think that they're going to score well when it happens. I'm hoping it's Ola Jacek just because if he wins, there's far fewer ways for him to get left out. And uh, also, that's my boy. I'm tired of seeing him lose. <laughs> but he's finally getting a striker. He's not going to submit him. So, um, no, nah, I, I like that fight. But, I mean, like I said, you know, it could bust if Shara wins a decision. So, there's there's no fights on this card where it's like 100% whoever wins is going to be in the winner. Um, but, you know, I like targeting that one pretty heavily. Yeah, I think that's fair. All right, let's talk about our stream parlay of the week. We talked about Dudikova, talked about the matchup with Sam Hughes. Would not be a stream parlay if I, if I did not pick a female underdog by decision. Uh, so we're going to continue with that theme, and I'm going to go Sam Hughes by decision. Take the zero from Dudikova. Uh, seems like an easy bet to me, Jake. Uh, I like a lot of Sam Hughes props. I like playing her in DFS, and I like the decision line. So what are you going to pair it with? Yeah, I like that too, man. I think... Uh... I think the dud's gonna dud here and Hughes is gonna win a decision. I'm gonna I'm gonna pair it with Bedoya decision, which is a little bit riskier at plus three twenty-five. 
five. Um, the guy has like one knockout win since like 2016. He's been to a ton of decisions. Uh, you know, Jai Herbert's really been slowing fights down lately. It's three straight decisions after he almost never went to a decision early in his career. So, but Dory could definitely finish him. But at plus three twenty five, I think that's pretty solid. And you know, the line moved from plus one fifty to plus one hundred five in the money line. The decision line hasn't budged. Uh, neither have the inside the distance props, which we were talking about. Seem, seems a little bit fishy, but I'm, I'm gonna bite on that. So. Plus 325, pair that with Hughes' decision. It's going to be plus 1260 for the parlay. So there you go. You want to tail a plus 1260 parlay. It's same Hughes' decision, Rolando Bedoya decision. Jake has given out both of these to uh, his subscribers over on MMADFS.com. You want those bets early in the week, go check out his site. I think we've done all the rundown we need to. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. Give us a thumbs up. Uh, if you are interested in best ball, we're doing a, uh, a giveaway for the first 500 subscribers on the new secondary channel, Occupy Best Ball. Uh, you can see the links throughout our channel and through our post. Uh, go subscribe over there if you want to enter that giveaway. Uh, if you have any questions, you can comment on this video below. The slate does start at noon Eastern on Saturday, so not much time to answer questions, but we will happily answer them for you. Uh, here on YouTube. The best way, however, is our Discord server, OccupyFantasy.com slash Discord. Jake and I are in there all the time. And uh, you come sweat out the fights with other members of the community. It's always a great time. So links in the description. Go check that out. For Jake, I'm Brian. Thanks for listening. Good luck and enjoy UFC Abu Dhabi.